This conference will now be recorded. Well, good afternoon. This is Joanne Forrester, also known as the Empress of Biz. Uh, doing what she loves to do is talking to you with one of her favorite people in the world, Sal Costa, the Duke of Business, talking about small business with our special guest, William Faulkner, who owns Faulkner Engineering. And we were just teasing him because as an engineer, <laughs> They aren't always so creative with their names. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome. Do you like Bill or William? I actually give up my middle name, Blaine. Okay. So that's where this William came from. It probably was on LinkedIn or. Okay. Well, welcome to the show because we're going to talk business and. Um, before we start asking you questions, how are you doing, Sal? I am doing fine, uh, surviving the, the coronavirus for, for people that are maybe uh, watching this, uh, maybe even years later after it's been recorded. We're here at the beginning of August in 2020. Uh, we've been undergoing the coronavirus pandemic now, give or take how you want to count here in the United States from about the middle of March. But uh, so far healthy, so far working. So other than being cooped up, no complaints. <laughs> I hear you, my friend. So how are you doing, Blaine? I'm doing well, and thank you for having me on. This is an honor to be on your show. And I'm with Sal. I'm very healthy, and we've actually used this time to get out more and go on hikes and, and explore the parks in Pennsylvania. So it's kind of <laughs> blessing in a way to be able to slow down and, and then spend more time with family. Mm. I hear you guys. I'm fortunately doing well. Also, uh, I have started more projects since I have, since this uh, COVID crisis, so, so to speak, has uh, started. And when people ask me, are you bored? I go, no, I don't have time to be bored because I'm doing 10 projects right now. So uh, would you tell us exactly uh, what's your, what type of engineer you are and what are the projects that you like to do, Blaine? Yes, I am an electrical engineer. I deal with mainly residential and commercial and some light industrial type projects where I'll provide like lighting services, fire alarm, power. I help contractors and architects navigate building codes and ordinances. I mainly deal with the National Electric Code is my bread and butter. And in a sense, I provide blueprints and I help people get their permits and I'll inspect projects. I can do facility reviews. And I deal project. Go ahead. Now, how long have you been in business? I've been independent for seven years now. Mm. What's the big difference when you say being independent and working for someone else? Well, I think I do probably more smaller projects versus the big teams. I'm not going to do the next PNC Tower. You know, that was a big team effort there. And they usually have, they probably have four or five electrical engineers. So to just bring on one electrical engineer might be a little unusual. That would probably be the biggest difference. I mean, I could help out in a sense. Maybe I could specialize on just audiovisual or just lighting. For take on everything, it would it would probably take me three years to build it, and they want it built in a year. Mm. Hey, let me ask you a question. Um, first of all, now in retrospect, because you know, becoming your own boss, having your own firm, obviously is is, is a big leap of faith. It's, it's a big change. And, and sometimes you don't know everything that you're getting into, quite, quite frankly. I talked to a lot of small business owners. So number one is now, in retrospect, are you happy? Did you get everything you were looking for? And, and, and maybe as even as a precursor to that, um, what motivated you to kind of branch out on your own and, and again, take the, the level of risk that's required to go out on your own when you're not clear where the next paycheck is coming from and where the next client is coming from. Right. I 
thought about this decision for a while, and I feel like I kind of backed into it. I had gotten sick a few times, and my health wasn't real strong, and I felt like I didn't have a good connection with my family, and I wanted that. And I wanted, and we just had children. And my dad worked a lot of hours. He worked for Bechtel. We would go. To, he would work at different nuclear power plants. And I mean, he was gone for a long time. I still work a lot. I still have to work some nights and weekends. Mm-hmm. But I'm, at least I'm here in the house, and I can see them. And I get to communicate with them more so than I guess I could pick up the phone and do FaceTime at home. But it's not the same. So that was a big reason to do it for me was just family and having you know even my wife I feel like there's in this industry I've seen a lot of people have heart attacks uh, um, you know from the stress so I wanted to try to find that balance I'm still trying to find that balance but I feel like what I was looking for I found it I you know they can't use that against me. Daddy's never home or daddy never comes to my events or so it was a, it was a blessing in a way to get sick, but I feel like I came out stronger on the backside. Hmm. That was one of the reasons um, back in the ancient times I started my business because I, I wanted to have more control of my life. And I was fortunate that I had two business partners that were older and and somewhat wiser than me. And I was the kid on the block and they threw me to the wolves a few times, but I learned. (laughs) And I loved the the freedom. Um, And when we would work with big companies, oh, I always got myself into trouble. I'd get fired, then I'd get hired back, and I'd usually get paid more. So I, I love being my own boss uh, and running uh, running my show. Hey, Sal, why'd you jump into business? Well, to tell you the truth, my reason was simply to, I'll just say it like this, just not to have a boss. I mean, not, not even necessarily to get rich although that you sometimes you know if, if you have your own business then then obviously your at least your possibilities are, are are much higher than being an employee because let's face it you know you're an employee for a big company um you know there's a budget for salary increases you know i i worked in times where if you got literally like a one and a half percent salary increase you were doing really well because that was reserved for the high performers because a lot of people were basically getting nothing. It was flat because that was the budget because things weren't doing so well. But but even though, again, that was sort of a, a, the, the, the higher sort of compensation was a possibility, that, that wasn't my motivator. My motivator was uh, not to have a boss that you had to be always kind of responding to, just being able to do my own thing, call my own shots and, uh, uh, you know, have my own destiny in my hands and hopefully if I make good decisions then then, then have a, a profitable company and then if not you can't blame anybody but yourself yeah any person you can fire is you <laughs> or um Blaine, when you um first started your business uh when you first started uh, working in the engineering field Looking then to now, what has changed? Um, when I first started out, you know, I felt like I was de- there were a lot of staff that I didn't connect well with, and I feel like there's more mentoring, there's more training. Um, you know, where to find that? I think like I had to search it out. One guy told me to do as many engineering review courses as I could. So now with the webinars and and some of the, I get these like almost what do you call, uh, it's just more like lunch and learns you could call them. So I feel like when I first started, I didn't see those right away, especially when I was learning things. I'm like, where do I find out about this? You know, I'd run across some system or some energy system and I just, you know, I would try to ask for help. Sometimes they were busy, 
So trying to find that information on my own now with the internet, there was still the internet, you know, I started out 15 years ago, so I'm not that new, but it's just so much more education material out there to help young engineers. Hey, Blaine, let me ask you a question because obviously in, in, in full disclosure for everybody, I, I know Blaine on, on a personal level for quite a few years now. So I also know, that you're a very, and I'll say either religious, spiritual, however you want to call it. How has that affected you, not only as an individual, but as a business owner? Because of that background, let me say, do you make business decisions differently? Do you do anything different from a business perspective? You know, I do try to have a devotion every day. I try to read my Bible every day to start out my day fresh. And one thing is I don't like to respond to people on Sundays. I like to try to relax as much as I can. And sometimes I know I get these like urgent emails and I'm like, can it just wait and respond first thing Monday? That way they can relax too. And so sometimes that's gone very well, not having to continue to play ball. So one time I did this, I got this proposal to do a project for medical marijuana. I kind of was like up in the air about it. But then the more I thought about it, I mean, there are people out there that have, let's say, seizures and need that type of medicine. And it was like trying to come to terms with something or wrap my head around something like that. At first, I was like, I was kind of, like I said, on the fence. But then I'm like, well, it's really to help someone. And can I help someone by doing my job? So that's kind of how that came about. That's interesting. I often ask myself, 10 years down the road, am I going to feel proud of what I just did? That's my, that's my weather vein. Because if I'm going to, if there's a part of me that says, ah, no, I won't touch the project. I just won't do it. So, um, technology wise, you started 15 years ago as an engineer. What's changed? And we still had some modeling software uh, like CAD and some simulation programs, but we definitely have some new lighting softwares where we can model 3D and see more of the building in 3D. Uh, I haven't got to use all of the software, but that has probably been the biggest change is like you get to really see the rendering of a building. You used to have to like sketch hand with colored pencils at the architects or do some sort of shading for lighting we my first time i did a lighting program we had the cad app they used to call it and it was pretty much what they call point to point method so just to do one room would take probably five to ten minutes now it takes me probably once i have everything selected up and running maybe a minute to do a lighting calc in one room so that's, that's helped a lot. And p clients like that. They want to see it. You can visualize it better. Let me ask you a question, Blaine. Um, right now, the, I'll say, uh, political situation with, with China is a little bit testy. Um, and it's, it's really unclear if it's going to get better or, or worse in, in the future. And, and I know that depends maybe even a little bit on, on the upcoming elections, but how much is that affecting the electrical industry? And I, I don't mean just necessarily your business in terms of maybe designing something, but I mean more broadly, you know, in, in terms of, you know, maybe some, some lighting that, that comes from China, some lighting products or, or wiring or whatever. How has that been affected so far? If the situation gets even worse, do you, how much more do you see it being affected? And how is that going to translate into maybe a potential cost increase for the owner of the house or the owner of a, a commercial building or, or an electrical project? So, so far, so good on my end. A lot of the products I make are what I call cookie cutter products. Like, a two by four light fixture, 
you're right, we can buy one from China. But most of the products are either made in the USA or from Mexico. Even a light switch or, you know, this Lutron, I think, is located near Philadelphia. And Southwire, they make, you know, obviously a lot of copper conductors is out of Atlanta, Georgia. Another company is called Acuity Brands Lighting, which is near Atlanta. But they manufacture most of their fi light fixtures, I think, in in Mexico. So a lot of that is here in North America. Uh, but you're right. I do have one client recently decided he was going to buy lights from China. And we went back and forth on this discussion because they didn't provide us with all the information I was looking for to give them a clear answer if this light was equivalent and if it was rated. Like they have to be UL listed and or some sort of listing by a third agency to be installed in a commercial building. And information was not available and I told them I could not approve this light. I think they ordered it anyways out of my recommendation, which I mean, you're, you're spending a lot of money. I mean, this is a, this is a big project. So the lights were over $200,000. They decided to go ahead and purchase, even though I told them this doesn't make sense to me at least. So, I mean, why are they willing to take that risk? I'm not sure, but. It, well, let me ask it, you this real quick. Follow. So it was a $200,000 in lighting that they bought from China. What would have been the, the closest equivalent coming from the U.S. Or, or from Mexico or from anywhere other than China? What, what give or take, what would have been the price differential? They don't, you know, clients don't always share with me the pricing. So it's kind of a cat and mouse game in a way because I'll go to a vendor or a, represent a representative for a company and they don't always like to reveal that information. I guess it fluctuates plus with their markup plus shipping. So they were probably, if I was to guess, maybe saving 20%. If, but they also lose out on support. So warranty wise, like if one goes bad, they're not gonna have anyone that's gonna come and look at it and try to give them a new one. I don't think warranty is strong when you order like that. That's fascinating. There's that little bit of savings compared to uh, what it actually costs them if something goes wrong, um, which hits my favorite subject. When you have bean cutters running the show, you got problems, <laughs> you know. It, and I, I and I don't care if there's a bean cutter counter out there. I'll be glad to argue with you anytime. Just call in, <laughs> whatever. Uh, and I've I've owned construction companies. I've been a partner in there, and. Um, Oh, that guys have thrown me on the site. And, you know, I learned a long time ago from them is there's nothing better than good, good equipment, good inventory, good products and immediate, you know, immediate service. So then the long term, we actually the short term, we would save money and get the project done because there was no delays. So uh, I have yet to understand the uh, rationale of waiting eight weeks until a product <laughs> is shipped over, you know? Yeah. Well, and not only that, it's, it's, it's again, lighting is something that, that, that lights by their nature at some point are going to burn out or going to break. I mean, mm -hmm. even if it's a couple of years down the road, but if you're still thinking about a building and you want to make sure that you have a supplier that you can go and buy more, mm -hmm. uh, because even if you buy a, a little bit of, of extra, you know, you, you know, you, you always want to maintain sort of a good aesthetics if, if these lights are visible. And even if they're not, just just to standardize from a maintenance perspective. So I, I think, to you know, kind of to what Blaine was alluding to, to me, it would be very important to have a, a supplier that, that you can count on five, 10 years down the road to to support the two hundred thousand dollar investment that you made in their product. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I can get my hands on them right away. Like, <laughs> Blaine, what? We, you 
know, you've been in business 15 years and you've talked about it. So basically, the slide rule, is the slide rule totally out? That was totally out when I started college 20 years ago. So my dad had one and we still have scales. I like to have things readily available. Like there was this one guy. I wish I had this. Let me grab it. Hold on. Oh, see, this is the beauty of, of these video chats. I, I think we're actually about to get a demo that we weren't counting okay. on. Yeah. So, <laughs> this is given to me by one of my first bosses. And I guess you could call it a slide roll. It's not the traditional one, but it says, like, you select your, your horsepower. And then, hold on. So it's, the horsepower is here, the motor the voltage, and then you select your circuit breaker. Yeah. And I wanted to get some more of these for some of our... Oh, yeah. I remember them. <laughs> it's easy to have right next to your desk. You just grab it and pick it up, and you're done within 10 seconds. But when I asked the vendor to supply me some of these more, Eaton, he sent me a link to say, hey, just look it up on on the website as an app well sometimes i gotta go hunt for that link or hunt for the email mm -hmm. the link and then punch the data in and then outputs it so again a 10 second process versus a sometimes I end up being a 5 10 20 minute process and i get distracted looking through my emails yeah <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of a, a neat way. And then on the back, it's it has three there's three phase motors. Uh, the same thing. There's some other information on there about what? Uh, yeah, I'm going the wrong way. So it's just very basic, but it gives a lot of information. It gives conductor sizes, fuse sizes, wire size. Yeah. Three different three phase for one. Yeah. Horse. The different horsepower promoters. Handy and practical. And I have yes. to know, Joanne, by the way, these are maybe just interesting little tidbits. The Panama Canal was built using slide rules because they didn't have calculators or computers back then. So, uh, you know, just don't, uh, anybody that's listening now, we got internet, we got computers, you know, the, the cell phone is almost, not almost, the cell phone is a computer. But you could do big projects like the Panama Canal with uh, slide rules. So it was the Suez Canal. You know? It's, it's fascinating to me because I I am I always feel that if something can break, it's going to break. And uh, the web's going to crash. The Internet's going to blow up, you know. And if you don't know how to counteract that, you're in trouble. That's true. The internet would, it doesn't seem to crash as much as it used to, but it seems like when you really need it to do get something done, it seems like I got an outage for an hour, at least every once in a while, <laughs> once a day, there's just like an internet outage in my neighborhood. So I'm like, I don't know why or how or what, but it does seem to happen. Well, I remember having a lot of these discussions way back when, and, and actually it was more just even calculator related. It was even before all these computers. But the problem that you have when you're dealing with physics or engineering and sometimes even accounting is you need to develop a feel for the numbers to make sure that you're not getting a crazy answer that's a couple of orders of magnitude off. And a lot of times, you know, uh, as, as a student, if you rely too much on, on your calculator or, or your computer, um, again, you may have a typo in there or, or the, the unit's wrong or if measure, units of measure wrong or something. Anyway, long story short, you could end up with an answer that is totally ridiculous, but because you don't have sort of a grounding in what's normal or what to expect, you just go with it and trust me, your rocket's going to blow up. <laughs> Right, right. Yeah, I I had an experience with um, I won't name the a very large steel company where I was doing consulting with one of my other business partners, and we were actually able to document a million dollar order where stainless steel order 
we were off one one thousandth of an inch, but that whole order had to be dumped. That hurt. And they tried to fire the employee and she had gone up to him and said, you know, this is wrong. I just know it's wrong. And she was told you're paid to enter the order and and not think. Well, they wanted to fire her and and very interesting scenario <laughs> that's all i can say uh but you know having that intuitive feel there's something wrong and then having the permission to follow through is really important yeah, i've been my fair, fair share of situations and i remember one time this you know, my lawyer came and explained we would have these lunch and learns once a year with the lawyers and they'd explain to us well it's really the contractor's responsibility i'm like oh, that doesn't fly out here in the real world you know fingers that you know they, they're relying on us for reliable information and so what i was trying to get to is i had a situation where the conduit was undersized and i double and i triple and sometimes I even quadruple check my calculations. It's so weird how, like you're saying, maybe I was in the middle of doing something and I got a phone call and I had to stop and I got distracted and I didn't finish inputting something. Or, you know, is that uh, by my nature? You know, I need to answer the phone while I'm in the middle of something. I'm going to just wait until, let's say, I answer, re return phone calls at the middle of the day. But, it happened and someone called it. We had what we call a clerk of the works. The contractor went ahead and saw it. I mean, it all got sorted out in the end, but it was kind of one of those situations where I was, you know, why don't we just fix it? Well, they wanted to have meetings. They wanted to understand what happened. You know, I had another engineer check my work. He didn't catch it. And just one little detail like that became, it became a bigger headache than just we ended up fixing it, of course, but you know, it was, it was frustrating for one number to be off. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're going to be. Hey, Sal, do you have any incidents like that? Well, I will tell you, in electronics manufacturing, um, a lot of times we would buy um, PC boards. And the only little detail is the PC board if, if you think about like literally like a board, it would have like multiple images on it. Okay. Multiple mm -hmm. images that were all the same. And those would eventually get broken out. And that would be the individual product that would end up getting sold, whether it was a, a computer board or a, uh, or a, a cell phone, you know, the inside of a cell phone or whatever. Um, but you had to be very careful with that for, for a couple of reasons. Number one, first of all, it wasn't always the same number of images on a panel. I mean, some had four, two, four, six, eight, twelve, you know, twenty, whatever. Um, but the buyers, when they were interfacing with the PC board manufacturer, would always buy in terms of panels. That so the order would be, you know, whatever, a hundred panels, a thousand panels. But they had to recognize that if there was again, let's say six images on on the panel, that would end up being 6,000 units of, of finished product that's going to get sold to individual customers. So, so you always had to make that translation. Um, and then on the bill of materials, a lot of times the way it would be set up is it would be the panel part number that would be in the bill of materials. But then because the bill of materials was for a single finished goods unit, you actually had to have in there instead of one component, one sixth of one component or one twelfth of one component corresponding to how many images were in that panel. So anyway, it was a total mess and it was very easy to either order too little or order too much because you always had to be making that correlation and that translation between images of a finished goods product that goes as an individual unit to the customer versus panels that get ordered from from your pc board vendor and and sometimes a, a buyer was thinking he was ordering you know a, a thousand enough to make let's say a thousand finished goods units and he was ordering six thousand and then instead of instead of having one month on hand you have six months on hand and it was like a big mess 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Lots lost in the, the communication. Um, Blaine, if, if you were to uh, talk to people starting their own business, what would be things that you would like them to be aware of? Uh, that you, you know, you'd like to share? I think when I started out, I, a business model is very important. I did work with the small business groups here in Pittsburgh. I use the one at Duquesne University. I also I think it's very important to have at least six months to a year of living expenses available oh, yeah. in your bank account. And and I also feel like projects just don't fall out of the sky. You got to get out there and work. You got to network. You got to make phone calls, meet people for coffee, and 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 grind a little bit to make it happen. I still do. I mean, I was looking at some business cards today, and I probably have. I'm gonna take a picture of it and put it on LinkedIn. But I probably have three a three foot stack of business cards where I went out and met people and networked and. And, and made new clients and friends through business. I mean, it may not translate well to everyone, but I thought I had some really good partnerships before I went out, which just didn't materialize because they would rather work with a bigger firm than, and I didn't know that. So I went out and met, met new architects and developers and contractors who needed help. And so I think just being persistent and, having a little bit of resiliency to you you may call you i've sent one architect 10 proposals and haven't got any work and that's just the cost of business sometimes and it, it doesn't bother me it just it's just the way it happens so um just being a you know having some some of that just grind to it so blaine let me ask you a, a little bit of, of a two-part question um, and I know you're you're a small business, but you're 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 in in a specific niche. So I'm going to ask you to maybe answer more generally for for thinking of any possible type of small business owner. Okay. Um, and the two part question is: right now, a lot of people are really struggling because of this coronavirus that's going on. So what could the state government, what could even the federal government do to help a generic small business kind of um, get through on the other side of this coronavirus and 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 be healthy coming out so that they can continue to conduct business? Um, and then even more generally, in, in normal times, normal situations, what kinds of things do you think, um, again, the state government or the federal government could do uh, to spur on business growth and, and business development in general for, for small businesses? That's a great question. I feel that, first of all, I wish we had a better schedule and a better clear activity. I know we're, they're trying to wait for a vaccine and it's a hard thing to do, but a little bit clearer because there were some situations that they open business and then they shut it down the next week. And I didn't think that was fair, especially to restaurants. But moving forward, I think they really need to work with some businesses and provide some some tax deductions or some sort of credits. But with that, I think some business needed to sharpen their pencil a little bit and it may have been exposed. And I think they should, those companies that take these credits, they should have to be required to go to the small business centers and maybe take some classes to go along with it because, um, but I mean, it may not work well in everywhere, but at least there's some training involved as well as their business. And maybe they are just, you know, running paycheck to paycheck. And I feel like the, a lot of companies do that. So they clear their books at the end of the year and they don't have a lot of equity or cash available. But um, I know that that might be something the government might need to work more with some businesses is allowing them to have more cash available instead of making them get taxed as soon as you make a profit and then otherwise because I know they try to move money around to do charitable or training or I forgot what they call it but they got like burn off is a term some companies use for 
investing in other companies. So allowing companies maybe to have a little more cash on hand might be helpful as well. Now, that doesn't affect me as much, but I think for small businesses, which I feel like are companies with 10 or less people, a tax deduction would help with some training, I think. And less regulation. <laughs> yeah. So what would you do? Oh, that is a, a, a very good question. Um, I think certainly training would be one. That's one that, and, and, and as Blaine is, is alluding, there's, there's a wonderful resource in, in pretty much every state. Um, it's a small business development center, SBDC. A lot of times they're attached to different universities. So that's definitely a, a resource um, that I would use. Uh, the other one that I would do, by the way, would be uh, tax credits, but specifically for hiring employees and specifically for exporting. Um, because I think that, that a company that figures out a way to be very successful exporting their product manufactured here in the US to a different country deserves a tax break and, and deserves recognition from the government through a tax break. Um, and the other one is, is, is again, um, some type of tax break or incentive for them to hire employees. Because I, I'll be very honest, employee has become a bad four-letter word. Okay, everybody wants to have 1099s. Nobody wants to have employees anymore. And along with that comes the, you know, the, the uncertainty from the part of the employees, am I going to have a job next month? You know, sometimes they don't have benefits. So, so a lot of that risk benefit equation has been shifted onto the shoulders of, of the employees by not being a W-2, being a 1099. So I would make sure to incentivize um, that to happen. And, and, and maybe one last thing, because we could go on this forever and ever and ever. Um, but I would all, and I know this was going to be controversial too. I think all of everything I've said is controversial, but um, I would have some type of training way uh, up to, you know, some age, I don't know, 18, 22, 26, and maybe some type of sliding scale, but just to make it easier for companies to hire somebody again at 16, 18, maybe all the way down to 26 uh because it's they they can do it cheaply but at the same time that person can come into the workforce get trained because i don't care if you have an mba or an engineering degree or whatever you have you still have to get trained not on, not only in, in real life as opposed to what you learned at school but also in the particular products processes technologies of that company so facilitate for the company to make that investment in that training and that knowledge transfer. And then when you get to a certain age, then, you know, you, you're there, you're embedded and, and, and you can continue your career at a more uh, higher level salary. That's, that's more competitive. So then somebody else doesn't hire you away. So uh, long answer to a short question, but I hope all that makes sense. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what makes sense to me is that I am uh, going to get myself into trouble, but the small business development centers are good, but I don't need a, a master's candidate teaching me. I need someone who actually knows what they're doing, who's been on the ground, who has done it. So that I would like to see a use of more people like us actually doing the consulting, getting, um, some kind of um yeah getting paid but anybody who's a phd or master's candidate or whatever you got a lot to learn there's nothing worse than in the middle of the night and you got to make a payroll and you don't know how you're going to do it yeah you know well, there's, there's well, a lot another organization that i think is more in line with with what you're saying and at the risk of maybe talking about a, a competitor in, in our consulting businesses, but there's a thing called SCORE, Service Corps of Retired Executives. Yeah. Uh, 
they're almost the the opposite end of the scale. They're they're retired after many years of work, and and you know a lot of times they provide their services free or at a very low cost. Um, and there's nothing to say that you can't use the SBDC and SCORE and, and different resources simultaneously. I think the only thing that we'll say is recognize that. I don't want to be too cynical, but you get what you pay for, and most of the time, not even that. Um, right. So there may be a common point in time, and I, I recognize that money start is tight when you're starting, that you have no choice but to bite the bullet and pay for a consultant, because that's the only way you're going to get the help and the resources that you need. But you can combine that, you can combine it with SCORE, you can combine it with SBDC, and I'm sure there's even other resources out there, and then you pick and choose and, and you blend, and depending on the help on the particular project, you want to go to one resource or the other. Right, right. And and with your SCORE, because I've, I've taught for them, um, you need to take a look at the background of the person who's doing the consulting. If they've always been a corporate executive and they've worked for you know the big companies. They don't know what it's like to worry about a payroll. They don't. They don't know what it's work like. Like when your your taxes due. How are you going to juggle that? I mean, so it really is matching whether you pay for it or not. Matching the right resource so that you get the mentoring. And that's one of the things I would like to see is for those of us who who do mentoring and I do a lot, but we get some kind of credit tax credit for it. Uh, I like practical solutions that work, um, that uh, a lot, uh, use the expertise of people like us, because uh, we've been there, we've done it. Um, God, I, more times than I want to admit, you know. <laughs> um, we, we've been chatting for, uh, oh golly, uh, over 45 minutes. Blaine, do you have anything you want to ask or um, Ask us. Um, Joanne, I know you've talked about your businesses. I'm, and you said you did a contracting business. What other businesses have you been involved in? Oh, golly, from public relations to counseling to owning real estate to uh, political consulting to <laughs> I just have uh, and I'm satiable taste for doing all kinds of different things <laughs> i've owned companies up to five five at a time or i've been in partnership five at a time um i'm not saying that's same believe <laughs> me <laughs> what about yeah. you sal well i was going to say i was actually uh involved with things that were uh maybe a little bit more pedestrian and, and a little bit sort of more main street type businesses um but but one was simply a uh a vending business um and and this was back by the way uh when people actually put money into the machines i oh, mean yeah. now if, i mean i guess they still take money but now i'm sure you know it's, it's all credit card and and I'm sure some of them are already going wireless with the cell phone and everything. So anyway, I did vending back when 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 you would actually open the machine and, and there'd be money in there. Um, and the other one was a a, uh, a, a service business, a mobile uh, oil uh, change business for, for cars. And then we did all sorts of other light mechanical stuff like replace the wipers or, you know, uh, tires that were low on, on pressure we would fill them up and things like that um and maybe like joanne there was a point in time where both of those were overlapping um so you know had to juggle employees and emergencies and and, and situations and, and both at the same time and uh and maybe going back to something she was alluding is when, when you have a small business with only a couple of employees if, you have certain activities planned and certain customer commitments and, and one employee calls in sick. It's a big problem. Um, so anyway, those were, were mine. <laughs> Blaine, have you owned more than one business? Yeah, I did another venture where it's called Scan Plan Go. And I teamed up with this company out of Pittsburgh. It's called Carta and they offer this robotics. Uh, from CMU, where basically 
it's a product where you would scan a building, put it into CAD, and it was like a 3D model. And it was so, and the, the idea was to be able to provide planning and scanning fast and quick. Um, so the technology doesn't use GPS. It uses a three, a, a black and white camera, a color camera, and what they call LIDAR. So it's, it's basically, a, like, it has like eight different laser pointers that are constantly going out, making points. And so I tried this as a service type business and I didn't do it on my engineering because I wanted to be able to go to other states faster without the red tape of engineering. I have to have a, and I have to get a license in each state. I got to get insurance in each state. I got to get approval from the board in each state. So that's one reason I did it under a separate LLC. And it was hard to juggle both. It was hard to get that ball rolling again and go out to architects and try to get more service type work. Um, I, I still have the equipment and I still work with it, but I don't advertise it as much. And I've been trying to sell the equipment to and move on just because I just don't have the time to do to do both. Mm -hmm. Well, as we do wrap up, uh, guys, what um, uh, the question I want to ask uh, all of us is with the situation right now, uh, with us sometimes being limited in contact, what's your best advice for building a business right now? What, what about you, Blaine? Mine is to really, truly try to help someone and, and have that passion to grow. And of course, cash is king. So definitely make sure you, you have your ducks in a row, whether it's financing or your living expense taken care of so you're not stressed out how you're gonna pay your bills or how you're gonna pay for your insurance, or if you do get sick, what are you gonna do about it? So I feel like just being able, and of course using, I like having a plan. I like, I feel like being prepared is is very key. And if you're not ready to play and, and take care of your clients, they'll know immediately. So and I also feel like one last thing I wanna say is I feel like not trying to take on too many clients at once and, and ends up hurting myself and other clients. Like trying to know when to say no is important. Uh, good point. Good point. What about you, Sal? I, I think the only thing that, that I would say is to keep a level head and not get too wrapped up in this coronavirus thing, okay? And I was talking to somebody the other day, and so I want to make sure that you know, and, and we were saying, oh, you know, same thing. Back in the middle of March, everybody thought this was going to be a two-week thing. We were going to do a two-week lockdown. And and then after that, everything was, was going to be back to normal. And I think people have been very unpleasantly surprised um, that here we are in August and, and this thing is, is still going on. Um, I'm not going to say unabated, but with significant ebbs and flows. But having said all that, keep a level head and don't let that be the only thing you think about when you think about what business to start or how to grow your business and how to proceed. I think it's uh, keep a focus on we're going to get through this, okay? Maybe it'll take us another six months. But in this in in the context of growing a business in the context of creating a business in the context of starting a business six months is the blink of an eye yeah. um so think about what you can do post pandemic and and just have that make sense and then go with it and and just executed in the context of hopefully being out of this coronavirus in another six months or a year at most. And my advice is don't get wrapped up in fear. The more you wrap yourself up in fear, um, the less your opportunities are. And right now I see all kinds of opportunities emerging and Someone somewhere is in a garage making a, or in a basement or using a slide roll 
or is doing something you know, that's going to blow up the whole thing and create a whole new industry. And it's only when you get tied up into fear that creativity and the opportunity to take advantage of what's going on out there stops. So, like, I, you know, I, I'm trying new things. I'm having a good time. And, um, Joanne, I'm going to come out okay. Yeah. I remember I heard this, my, my preacher had this sermon that during the Black Plague is when Isaac Newton went into quarantine and had his thoughts. And that's when he created a lot of his yeah. laws in physics during the Black Plague. So, I mean, I definitely like what you're saying. We're going to see some exciting things come out of this. And it, it, it's for a reason. Yeah, I, I believe that. And that's amazing because, you know, we, we're talking about the virus and where the Black Plague worked out like uh, almost half of Europe. Mm -hmm. That was a, a, you know, so millions and millions of people died. So uh, we're going to be fine. Sal, would you like to do a wrap up? Yeah, well, I just want to say, Blaine, thank you for, for joining us and taking time out of your your busy schedule to, to join us and not only sharing a little bit about what you do, but asking some, some insightful questions uh, back at us. And uh, I, I wish you the, the greatest success uh, with your firm. And uh, again, you know, say stay strong and healthy. And uh, I'm very confident that we're going to get out of this. Uh, again, I don't know if it's six weeks, six months. It's not going to be six years. Um, and, and, and we'll come out of it just fine. I mean, we're, we're making connections all over the world. Businesses are becoming more efficient because of this, believe it or not. So so we'll be okay, and thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>